Hello everyone, today we talk about the defense of the herbs in the Augustan age uh, as for the first time a true system of defense and of garrison of the city of Rome was created as Suetonius in his Augustus 49 points out. The end being of course the protection of the imperial position and to ensure the public order in the capital, right? These issues had really been quite serious um, to the point of having made the Republic dying, right? After the disorders, the attacks, the the street battles, especially in the late fifties uh, of the first century BC, the Senate had to had to trust power in that instance to, to Pompey in order to uh, secure the public order with those uh, that warlords private forces as the fact that the Senate didn't control the Empire uh, anymore and Rome was already a, a massive city in, uh, in, in Augustan times in spite of its further uh, expansion presenting remarkable security issues given that the city was still very say different from how we uh, mostly think in in the heyday of the imperial era augustus definitely contributed to as you know uh, to many great public works etc but most cities like in in uh, in the ancient world medieval times and also for most of the modern era were really quite turbulent with a very um, high demic concentration in households that looked at a point some, uh, some sort of fortresses were very you know complex structurally um, and also quite easily uh, destroyable by, by a degree not just by fire um, and the city of Rome like the other cities was controlled factually by uh, the mob Right, the great household, also in the Atlantic world, the okay, okay, etc. All the, the the major cities in the world were ruled by local guilds, fundamentally, the collegia, specifically that had their own, in fact, armed forces, right, as paramilitary troops, right, um, private militias, fundamentally. But these had already been right part of the broader uh, nobility or clientels by by a certain degree and. Um, and so, one the, the entire, for example, city supply system was subcontracted to these entities. As again, the the world at the time was just a massive feudal system, right? Where everybody there was hardly any kind of centralization by the degree we intend in contemporary times, right? Not even in um, in actual states like like the Roman one. So. Um, it was imperative, in fact, to secure at least uh, a degree of um, deterrence within the city um, gates that, as you know, were also a sacred uh, perimeter that uh, could therefore not be accessed by an army proper. Today we don't talk about the Praetorian Guard per se, but we will talk, for example, about the Speculatores Augusti that at a point would become the elite of the same Praetorians. Um, but the latter, as you know, being essentially nine cohorts exactly to avoid t through the tent to have a full legion. And so that would make the thing, as you know, since Sulla's times was not just Rome, but uh, basically all uh, Italy s south of the Rub Rubicon uh, River you know, to to be occupiable by by legions naturally during the civil wars this had to happen as well and also during early imperial times the same Rome would be uh, devastated by some of these forces including the, the b battalion auxilia that um, made an important part of the same imperial bodyguard specifically the Equites corporis custodes, but we don't talk specifically about that. Also, because today we talk specifically about Augustus, 
right? So any other reference is for other videos. There were, in fact, different other forces, not just the Praetorians, the aforementioned bodyguard, the Equites Singularis Augusti. And these were very specific corps that uh, were you know, also basically the, the elite of the, uh, of the Roman army. Uh, as, as such, because there is also this, this bit the stereotype that the Praetorians were lazy, privileged forces without an actual kind of broader military capabilities, it's actually wrong. Right? These were some, not just because they were veterans themselves, uh, so they had already proven their value, but also because they would put up uh, at some point some some fights and also last teams that are really uh, remarkable uh, in in military in military history. This was even especially during the the civil wars. And Praetorians, as you know, were not even established classically by by Tiberius, right? With the um, standardization, let's say, of those nine cohorts, namely as a as a stable core, right? The Praetorians were um, essentially the, the in fact the, the the Praetors' bodyguards, and by a broader extent, the the ones that had always followed the Roman generals up to this point. In fact, the same speculators that become Augusti, but were also Antoni originally. Uh, and uh, they were, in that case, as we'll see, essentially a cohort, but more of the, their organization later. Um, and um, again, the people, right? The the Roman population, this massive, again, infrastructural system that had to be guarded, garrisoned, patrolled, right? You know, you know, there was a curfew that going out in Rome at night normally was, was not a thing, like in traditional cultures, uh, night is night, people don't go around, right, and uh, they would do it just at their own risk, right, naturally some would, and some with important escorts, but the same Nero, for example, at, uh, at a point risk to be taken out um, at night uh, in, in, the, in the city streets, so uh, we're talking about very also strong power ratios, because of the directness of the aforementioned collega and or other political forces that agitated within the, the city, also in a kind of tension with, with the authorities, again, any center of the time. There is no place in the world where you say, well, here after all there is a, the possibility of just a stable, constant uh, prospect of political continuity. Every weakness, every uh, sign of weakness was exploited, uh, was made leverage on, right? So the establishment of this guard force was was crucial for securing the power in the same role. Um, so Augustus provision and so the, the establishment of such defensive system constituted um, a very explicit break with tradition because in spite of the again the the, the lack of legions formally Never before Augustus a uh, stable armored force had been placed to garrison Italy within the sacred boundaries of the Pomerium or Pomerium if you prefer ecclesiastical, even if at least as far as the legions were concerned, the principle was observed still for other 200 years up to the establishment of the second part in legion in Albanum by um, work of Septimius Severus. Um, this force still was mostly made up of Italians, still uh, in fact the beginning of the third century we made a, a bit about the siege of um, Aquileia by Maximinus Trax and the importance that still in fact the um, the prevalent Italian element within this uh, guard forces, right, of Italy, and that could also participate, in fact, as just as uh, the legion to, to to the defense of of the peninsula was a bit of a hallmark, but still that kind of imperial pride that the uh, peninsula populations had maintained, right, since Augustan times that had made of uh, uh, Italy, the entire 
uh, peninsula and beyond historically as you know as you know the 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 identities were relatively um, heterogeneous as far as at least the uh, the the Italic background was mostly a central and, and southern Italian thing. The north had been uh, Celtic and uh, just eventually Romanized, and there were other other populations like the Ligurians, the Etruscans. But when we speak of the forces, uh, starting from in fact the, the Praetorians, here we will see also the Speculatores, etc., uh, there would be a markedly uh, Italian character. And the the Augustan ones, for example, this, the Augustan speculators initially up up to Actium were Spaniards, right? Um, and as you know, there would be also Germanic bodyguards, etc. But the idea is that these forces were somewhat the most privileged, and in the first centuries of the empire, still uh, a consistent part of the uh, of the Roman army was made up of you know Romans coming from the Italian peninsula. So this still embodied kind of the idea of, of an elite and of the imperial privilege detained by them to the defense of Rome. So as we've seen, something that had been uh, unusual and actually, you know, uh, anew by, by a certain degree in such institutionalization from a military point of view, right? Also the uh, Second Legion Particular was established like Albanum's, the so called Roman castles right south of of the city. So just to to watch over over Rome, also in a more in a safer way with a full legionary complement, or at least an additional one, considering that in fact, as we will see, the the Praetorian courts were not the only forces to garrison Rome, and others actually added multiple cohorts as well that were even more than one legion right it just didn't figure as such uh, in 27 BC Augustus instituted an imperial guard known as Praetoria this was articulated in nine citizen cohorts right and it was thus similar in concept to what would be established for good by by Tiberius and the task was the one of ensuring the protection of the princely person and to escort him in the external military campaigns. Mm -hmm. Every cohort commanded by a tribune was composed by roughly 500 men as the normal organic of of a legionary cohort at that time recruited principally within the regions of central northern Italy, as we were saying before. This uh, this switch also towards the north is is typical of the um, of the late republican and early imperial times, as fundamentally the the Po Valley had become the most important um, strategical uh, region for the control of the empire. The same uh, Octavian and Antony, as you know, had clashed bloodily in Mutina for that. It was the main recruitment pool of uh, and, and also of stationing of, of the Roman legions of this time. So that it had also kind of an obvious uh, proximity to, as it was close to Rome, and also populated by communities that had traditionally served um, in the in the in the army ever since the Roman conquest as a mean of their, uh, in fact, of their elevation, eventually to the same full Roman citizenship uh, that they had earn, earned on the field and represented that same capacity in this case of Celt or Celticized population of sharing the, the, the full imperium, right, having been in fact also quite loyal 
to the Caesareans and finally the victorious Octavian that had essentially reached those uh, their, their own Italic neighbors in that kind of of accomplishment. Right? You know that at this time also lots of Transalpine Gauls were uh, essentially doing the same in the in the Roman army, uh, etc. So uh, the idea being also that these uh, forces of the Imperial Guard were recruited properly among the best veteran elements. There was also uh, physical discrimination. Praetorians had to be tall, right? Uh, Herodian describes them as megistoi in Greek as meaning the, the biggest, right? Physically the, the greatest. A minimum of one meter and 77 centimeters. Times of civil war everybody would be hired, but generally speaking, and especially for these um, for these guard uh, units, the the physical uh, side of the story was very important. It was also, in fact, representative. And still today, in fact, guard bodies have such uh, pretty like tall standards. Over time, uh, such requirements were integrated also with some greater skills. This is even as for example, the aforementioned speculatores would be gradually substituted by the equites singularis that also had a sort of, uh, as you know, excellent military engineering curriculum. They, they served for a dramatically long time with very specific, um, in fact, organizational tasks uh, in the army um, and more. And, and let's say that, in general, good birth and family connections helped too to secure a place in the in the guard, right? Um, we'll, this is true as we will see now so for the so-called urban cohorts, the urbanicani, and partly same vigilas, right? And these forces were also drawn from other elements, not just the um, the army, albeit um, as we have seen also in, in the video about the Militas Classiari, the Roman Marines, like there wasn't much of a difference, let's say, from the, uh, the Marines of the classes, uh, Misenatis, right, and um, and the same goes for the Avocati that were recruited from there um, as as well. Uh, but we will talk about, for example, the latter just in in another video. Then in the Guard Organic, commanded by the Praefectus Praetorio, there was also um, a corps. Some say just of of, of horsemen. Right, 300 specifically, but as we will see, the thing is more complex. The Speculatores Augusti, uh, destined to the same princely escort, at least there is uh, a close proximity of the Speculatores with the Germanic bodyguard, for example. And uh, but it was there were two different things. And likely also to the management of special operations, which also the Evocati were were created. However, not as they were also attached to the um, forces that w would be given eventually the Praetorian barracks later on, the permanent um, uh, let's say stationing. That, as we we're saying, are just another thing. But these speculators are a very interesting force because they were born, as we have seen, probably as 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 a picked elite force of maybe skirmishers or troops of the vanguard. Um, we know that uh, they were specialized with the Lancia, for example. Um, but they had various roles and perhaps when they were eventually absorbed uh, in the in the rest of the Praetorian force later on they may have still represented the elite maybe the men of the first ranks and so on in any case these were forces that were easily trained with any kind of um, weaponry for any kind of, of tactical employment um, we uh, we know that they are incorporated in the Equites Singularis Augusti towards the end of the first century AD, in the missions times, um, and they were considered as a senior corps before that, right? Um, 
and being replaced by the, the most elite uh, unit here. However, as far as the organization of the speculators prior to their full integration into the Praetorian cohorts, we, we don't know much, right? The corps comprised both infantry and cavalry, for sure. There are at least um, different hints of this. The, um, uh, of course, the, the speculators existed also in kind of a military context that is the one from which, in fact, all these forces were drawn. But in the case of this specific core or unit, we um, we think of some sort of standardization later on in, in the guard role that was somewhat operationally different or at least much more specialistic, right? Um, as a, originally under Anthony, they were a cohort, right? So they theoretically didn't differ very much from the from the rest of the legionary infantry that made up the vast majority of the legionary forces. Maybe they were the first cohort in some way, or an additional one again that had this ideally skirmishing role, but was still kind of heavy infantry at large and or comprising cavalry forces as well. You know the same legionnaires were trained to switch tactical roles at a point having lighter heavier armament depending on the kind of role we, we were the antisic nanny for example right uh, it's more like a function than a, a tactical specialty and even if stereotypically maybe they, they covered roles that required um, in fact uh, a different fighting style most of the time still this doesn't tell much about what the full potential of these forces um, really was. We can try to reconstruct their organic from their um, their, um, their their leaders, like their their NCOs. Um, we know there was an exercitator of the mounted speculators. Uh, these forces normally carried out very uh, refined maneuvers which they performed not just in combat but for example in public ceremonies uh, etc so they were quite in intensely trained forces the, the best ones right and we know certain maneuvers or uh, formations were were performed also in front of the emperors we know of course of similar types of uh, we know of different games first of all that were held by the, the, the troops also the legionary forces in the provinces etc as we will see now uh, the, actually today we don't talk about that but it's obvious that the way Rome was garrisoned was similar to the way other cities were garrisoned especially with the Cortes Urbanae that we will see now um, so there weren't really many ways <laughs> you know uh, soldiers could could be right the same Praetorians were practically identical to any other legionary force um, they just had kind of a, a greater selection they could afford the, the best equipment but for the rest they were completely identical to the, all the other legionary forces they, they, by the way they also had cavalry of course and so on so um, other Centurions among the Speculatores are known. The Centurio Speculatorum, in fact, and the Centurio Speculatorum Equitum. So, stressing properly the, and, uh, the, the presence of both infantry and cavalry forces. So, these were also complete uh, tactical units. Um, it's uh, not certain whether the Exercitator outranked these two centurions. Any grade of speculator centurion was evidently senior to the centurions of the Praetorian cohorts in, in, in comparison. But supposing the speculators had a strength equivalent to a regular uh, cohorts quingenaria, so between 480. Uh, 500 men as um, 
is suggested also by the same Antony's cohorts speculatorum that is in fact number uh, in such size it would have required a commander of equestrian rank like the tribunes of the regular Praetorian cohorts and we don't have any evidence of such officer and it was suggested that a senior centurion of guard um, bearing the title of Centurio Trecenarius commanded these speculators because it would speak of this 300 men and it is possible in fact that a centurion could command um, 300 men or a triple sized century also because in theory the uh, the the primipilarian centurions commanded for example the entire cohorts um, and 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 thus you know it could be even even more right and so it was surely a, a commander of the of the of all the speculators that was in charge of their tactical employment um, we know also that later on from the Severian period the centuries of the urban cohorts that we'll see in a while uh, they were close to them they, they lived um, together appear to have been 250 strong so that would be the 80 men per century that had come to be fundamentally by Marian times and somewhat unaltered uh, per tree so 240 in that case so 250 40 whatever However, the most likely explanation is that the Trecenarius is, was just an honorific title that appears, like in the sources, applied to men who had passed through three of the Roman, uh, the, properly the, the, the centurionates of Rome. In fact, in all three the types the, uh, of cohorts, the, the one of the Vigilas, the Urbanitiani and the Praetoriani. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, for the speculators, we have no knowledge of subunits such as the Centuriae, the Turmai, or the Curiae. Um, when the speculators ceased to be a special bodyguard on its own, as we've seen, they were enrolled in the Praetorian cohorts. Right, so at that point they would identify um, themselves by the cohort numeral, and because they were all numbered up from one to nine, uh, and th the name of their centurion. That was basically the thing. Um, and albeit it is still possible that they could form a, a distinct fighting unit. Unlike in the Praetorians, there is no evidence of having their own standard, which is a big deal, or under officers like the Optiones. Right? Um, and so it's all quite speculative, telling the truth. And interestingly enough, from the Laterculi, that are essentially inscribed lists of Praetorian veterans from the 2nd and the early 3rd century, so later sources of course but there were way more speculators than equites within the praetorian guard so um we don't know what what this means in practice whether these speculators were still kind of uh for example lighter skirmishing cavalry as opposed to kind of heavier equus but it, it may have just been some sort of internal ranking kind of organizational notion right we are completely blind uh, about uh, about this we for example have a description uh, of on the gravestone of Ulpius Emeritus that was a Praetorian of the third century AD naming him as Miles Speculator, right? So this could distinguish the Miles, um, you know, typically the legion here, as uh, probably an, an infantryman, as, as different from, from an equus. Mm -hmm.
So that at least we would could seem that fact speculators had been uh, not just equitas but also militas, and this at least is what we also knew at the beginning as well. But there is this idea that the speculators were most mostly kind of a, a mounted force, right? And it's it's possible maybe, and uh, there was some of this guy. I, per I I don't think so, but it's just uh, an hypothesis. And we have also further uh, later evidence about this, but um, there is just the idea that the speculators wouldn't disappear completely as a force by the, the middle years of the third century, where lots of things start changing, but just acquired a new title that is Tectores, that is the contraction from Protect so the protectors um, and uh, we find a protector for example in the second uh, legio secunda partica of, Al of Albanum so that's quite relevant um, and we also know of Tectores Equitum so as a sort of mounted bodyguard in fact was also by the way a priest of the temple of Mars within the Castra Praetoria in Rome um, however, we don't know um, um, more more examples of this kind. However, we don't know whether the tector in this regard was a different type of speculator or a new type, let's say, um, or whether it was an alternative title for the singularis who guarded Praetorian tribunes and prefects. So this is absolutely normal in the broader... Um, say lexicon of the time we're in prelinian times there's nothing like a modernistic categorical um, meaning of specific terms and also we simply don't know how these units had been uh, evolving organizationally speaking um, and uh, whether these are tactical roles um, administrative uh, names or whatever so this is part o of the issue, but it's still worth remembering the speculators because normally they're not so um, not so concerned. Instead, from late Republican to early Imperial times, it, they they were definitely the the best, right? Of the best. Um, around 13 BC, Augustus instituted also a core of city milites initially articulated on three cohortes known in fact as cohortes urbanae so the cohorts of of the urbs of rome so the urbs the city par excellence and in fact also known equally as urbaniciani so the, those of the of the urbs right and their task was principally some sort of police in public order f um, keeping force uh, however they did have military roles as well the urbaniciani so were properly soldiers of the city cohorts and we're talking about the so very mm, very effective troops Right, and these were essentially a parallel of the same Praetorians. In many ways, we wouldn't find an actual distinction in quality. Right, uh, they were the soldiers of the so called city cohorts, which was another way of saying, okay, we can't have more than the nine cohorts in Rome officially uh, as part of the same, uh, in fact, of, of an entire legion. So these do not figure as Praetorians, but as some sort of cohorts of the city of Rome. This is to be found, again, in for, for other cities in the empire as well. There are several graves labs about this and historical, um, other broader documentary evidence. These cohorts were, however, separated administratively from the Praetorians still. Under the command of a senator, of consular rank who headed the Praefectura 
urbana. The Urbanicani were divided into four very large, by the way, 1500 men cohorts with numerical designations that followed on from those of the Praetorian cohorts, signifying the precedence of the latter but also the continuation of the same. They were known, in fact, initially as decima cohorts. So the the ten that would have made there the, an entire legion had these been part of the, of, the, of the Praetorians, un decima, duo decima, and tertia decima. Each was commanded in turn by a tribune chosen from among former legionary primi pilares, that is, from those first spear centurions that uh, at the end of their service were immediately promoted to knightly rank um, and could even aspire to praetorship. Um, so this was a certification of uh, command quality given that the centurion first peer had risen through the rank essentially to be the best fighter and commander in fact of, of the entire legion. So this was a great um, honor, of course. Um, in the second century AD, the Cortes Urbanae would pass from the command of an urban prefect to that of the Praetorian prefect. And the Urbaniciani were so important, not just for the city of Rome, but for the whole empire, that during the first two centuries of the Principatus, the garrison of Lugdunum in Gaul, today's Lyon, included a rotating 500 men urban cohort detached from Rome's garrison. Right, so this was a quality force that for such an important city like Lyon, by the way, that was one of the greatest um, and most successful examples of Romanization with the altar of Gauls to the Dea Roma and Augustus, by the way, that it represented, in fact, kind of a, a Roman filiation um, uh, to Lugdunum and thus with the, the entire Gaul, because this was the, 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 the symbol city of all the three Gauls, um, and thus this very rooted urban connection right that would remain over the centuries much of what we discuss in late antiquity early the early middle ages also the connections with rome and the gallic church and later the frankish one was so intense because of this radical connection that existed between gaul and italy for centuries and that still has i'd say in fact quite actual um, meanings um, in, in, in Western history. Um, and, um, and this is very powerful because it, is, it still shows that concept, of course, of uh, imperial elevation of, the, uh, of anyone, Roman, right, that would have served, in fact, uh, the, the, same, the same empire and proved that superiority. And that made any city of the empire basically just um, another Rome, a copy of Rome, uh, the same Rome, just on a smaller scale. Without understanding this primary meaning of Romanity, there can't be hardly the understanding of any other uh, historical uh, reality and, and, and the consequences uh, of, of it all. So, um, uh, a twin garrison, the same Roman garrison, both in Rome and Lugdun. And cohorts, in fact, increased in the process. We know from the sources, for example, the, um, the tertia decima cohorts, the um, quarta decima, the um, septima decima, the um, due devicesima, that is the eighteenth, also, the 
Prima Flavia Urbana, by the way. So even some cognomina entering with uh, a new uh, numeral series, um, interestingly enough. However, the Roman garrison wasn't all. Um, the the Evocati were part of the Roman guard as well. These were in part also drawn from the cohortes urbanae, from, from the marines, from, from lots of other troops. And they didn't have really, in fact, a real core or even a bexillum on their own. But um, in addition to all these security troops from 6 AD, also seven cohorts of vigiles, so watchmen, etymologically, in part connected, as you know, to the firemen business, were raised, in fact, for police and fire watching duties. Uh, they were under the control of a praefectus vigilum, so the watch prefect, and each was led by a tribunus, a princeps, and seven centurions. Centurions. The watch prefect and all the junior officers were drawn from regular army units as well, right? So uh, it, it's also likely that they kept their former uniforms in the process. Also, the gear of the Praetorian cohorts, the Equites Singularis, the Urban cohorts, the Vigiles, and the Evocati, Augusti, were all of top quality, right? The Vigiles, too, were very well equipped as well. Um, with the uh, Damnatio Memoria, which was carried out um, by Constantine against the uh, the Praetorians, the Equites Singularis, and even the Urbanicani, deprived uh, scholars of much information about their equipment. Actually, these units were integrated in the same Constantinian guards and other forces. Uh, the problem is that they were um, erased, like in celebratory inscriptions, in the public monuments, etc., so that we don't have that specifically. Naturally, at the time, th these troops had followed the uh, the the day's equipment uh, changes, so there's nothing um, in terms of uniformity connected to the type of weapons. We know, for example, the Praetorians uh, had a different outfit from the rest of these forces, but they could be because of special badges, insignia, colors at a point, even though they were probably very varied in, in that regard, as you know. Um, in, in this time, what really made the difference between the civilian and the miles was the latter's kingulum militaris, and so the fact that they really only bore weapons in the first place. Um, so even though we, we don't have this direct kind of uh, archaeological evidence anymore, we still can easily find uh, them represented here and there, even without tag. But still, I don't know, on the Antony uh, column, you, still, you, you see guards there, you know how they were kept. Um, there, are, um, th there is a good evidence of the Praetorians, um, also on the Trajanic frieze showing the Milites, the Equites, even in the musicians, the standard bearers. Um, so uh, we have to think really as a big thing, these were the guards of the Universal Empire, so uh, a, a huge magnificence was a, attached to them, and probably unlike any others, um, in also in historical perspective, it's just we, we're talking about quite archaic times, and so we, we are in fact often deprived also by the later developments of uh, more direct information. But these were the, the prime of the Roman forces. Uh, on the same Constantinian arc in Rome, there are images, say, of decorative panels taken from Marcus Aurelius' uh, time, uh, used to represent there even some uh, quality troops. We have some funerary stelae that were preserved, um, uh, and and more, right? 
Urbanikiani and Vigiles wore helmets. This we know linked to the ancient Italic tradition. For example, a Montefortino type helmet with the inscription Aurelius Victorinus Miles Cortis Duodecimae Urbanae shows that the city guards were still wearing the ancient traditional Roman panoply. And also the, the Montefortino, as you know, was, was essentially the simplest type uh, available. It could probably be made of, of the finest bronze, let's say, so as to surpass even some probably also made of cheaper industrial construction, maybe Italic and Gallic uh, early imperial types. I made a video about them back in the day. Um, so classicism, this kind of also broader, uh, uh, say, uh, heroic aesthetics that sometimes we look at the, the iconographic evidence and say, well, maybe this is just a poetic license. But as you know, uh, equipment was not really standardized in the in the contemporary sense of, of the word. Of course, there were standards that were imposed by the same Roman army, but these were essentially about more or less the type type of weapon, the kind of weapon in the first place, even the, the subtype that you had to wear, and there was a great deal of customization uh, as well, right? Um, we mm, uh, we see even some dwarfs dressed as Urbanikiani in the famous fresco from Pompeii. While were they represented like this, we don't actually know, because as we've seen, these people were especially tall, given they were selected uh, as such. Uh, it could have been maybe a Catonic symbol, the idea of a connection with the plebs, maybe. Um, in any case, uh, it's just, in this case, an artistic license. Um, they wear Montefortino helmets, so confirming part of the uh, of what we were saying about Victorinus, with red crests, muscled bronze and iron armor, and round clipe, an identical Montefortino helmet to the one depicted in a painting of Fabius Rufus in Pompeii that is surmounted by a red-pink plume was found in Cremona. And uh, that's we know that that, this, that was still around by that time. Um, an Attic helmet, probably belonging to a Vigilis, was found in Herculaneum as well. And from the same place comes also a Phrygian-shaped helmet of the Conversano type uh, decorated with a Roman eagle on the back, um, and this too could have been used by uh, by a bigilis, right? Um, and uh, this watchman uh, profession could have been a a family tradition until the destruction of the city in the in the disaster of seventy nine A.D. Right, so. We have um, definitely a tie. These were the same continuation of the local militias in, in, in some way, right? So um, being co-opted by the same imperium for the, the self-administration and um, security maintenance of the Rome, of, of, of the same community. So these aspects are, are crucial to understand also the degree by which, for example, the state would likely supply um, equipment for such forces, but also providing uh, with some kind of, uh, in fact, salarium, and not that not differently from the legionary one could provide the um, the, the the soldier with personal means to provide uh, to, to, to integrate the same equipment with other type of elements such as decorations and you know it, it was somewhat normal we find even many provincial styles uh, across the frontiers that document that kind of local bias let's say and we find um, troops of the guard and this other um, units really frequently in 
time important roles. Claudius, for example, was said to have never ventured to a banquet without being surrounded by his speculators, with Lankei, by the way. Uh, also, during Galba's journey through Italy to Rome, in 68 AD, he was ac accidentally jabbed by the Lanca of a speculator. Um, we know that the standard bearers and some speculators employed a small rounded shield, the Parma, um, so pointing at some kind of lighter kind of, of gear, at least for, for some of them, maybe consistent with the idea of being mounted skirmishers of sort, you know, it was the the archaic equitas that according to Polybius still had the Parma by the time of the second period, which was just not even true. Um but the, the Velites as well so this kind of kind of uh, lighter forces. And this complement provided definitely the herbs with a with a special protection and you have to think this this as as a giant living being that consumed in fact also a dramatic amount of resources and had to be kept well well fed well protected well administered and in a broader political and strategical need of course Italy and Rome were protected by Augustus through the reorganization of the fleet at least if this was attributed to him and it probably fits yes his broader reform uh, after the end of the civil wars through the institution of two principal commands one in Misenum for the western Mediterranean so this famous base in Campania on the Tyrrhenian Sea and one in Ravenna on the Adriatic Sea for the eastern one so uh, as a gate towards the most urbanly and financially developed part of the empire and so this connection with the east if you think about it in perspective later on we talk about Byzantine Italy the same Venice the, idea that the Adriatic connected Italy to the Byzantine Empire to, to, to the east also even before the Crusades with traffics that control the sea uh, the, the Silk Road through through the monopoly and at that point like the, the maritime force um, of the Italian city-states had on the Levantine ports, not just those, but say that this necessity of securing the Mediterranean control, well, was something firmly established in, since Pompey, Caesar, and Augustus times, and would remain fundamentally unaltered for for 300 years. So. We're talking about uh, a massive, uh, massive expense for it, but the the, the empire could absolutely afford. That point was the richest empire that uh, the West had ever seen. The um, the amount of wealth could also just m pay for for maintaining the forces was the largest expense, but properly providing them with adequate infrastructure. In fact, the various ports um, of the Roman navy were really, the arts of the Roman navy were really imposant, and there is still, in fact, a famous archaeological trace, not just the military ones for that matter. And they all departed from, from Italy, of course. Um, so, yes, this is pretty much it. As I was saying before, we will talk about the Praetorians in another video about other forces connected to the city defense uh, and the imperial bodyguard which also has their quite interesting uh, mechanics and as you know pools of recruitment and more in any case it's important to realize the, the complexity right the comprehensive dimension of this defensive system that, as you understand, is also expression of different elements of of the empire, and, and in this phase especially of this hardcore, functionally mm, affirmed, uh, properly military uh, system that uh, the Imperium, in a sense, the same Principatus embodied as the successful 
uh, institutionalization of Roman of the Roman dominion and w with the same capacities of, of replicating itself uh, through the ever closer connection of various provinces to that to Romanity and through such models also city garrisoning again the example of Lucknum is is fantastic and all of this by the way and just because I digress often on that topic was all connected with very special and specific um, religious meaning right the entire imperial ideology revolved around the military religion of Rome and all these cores had a very specific connection probably with Rome herself we have seen it also with the altar to to Rome in Lugdunum and that's why they rotated troops from from Rome as the city garrison as well there and uh, we have seen a speculator was also the priest of Mars within the Castra Praetoria which which of course religion was everywhere and these were the most ultra elite and uh, traumatically and fanatically hyper exalted individuals of the world empire right so these were the men who had been selected for the top military quality and service and uh, and expertise and therefore they had earned that privileged status but also providing with the in fact the best uh, uh, the, the best protection to the emperor also as you know in the long run also with a threat but still being quite potently uh, deterrent force and this is a broader logic in the need as we've seen of the Romans to, to show that there wasn't really an army there so having the, the, the picked troops that could also provide with the best uh, the most muscular the most um, impacting military forces in front to, to dominate the masses right but having the you know the least number in theory so to um, to functionalize the, that, that thing. Eventually the Castra Praetoria, as you know, were built so that they were all stationed there. Initially they, they were separated. Um, so there was also a very specific reference in the northeast of the city as far as the, in fact, the, the guard barracks really, really were. Of course the Imperial Palace had guards as well, but the, you know, there was no need to show the entire military potential there. Um, and um, yeah, we've seen the Urbaniciani being also pretty sizable units, right? To speaking of tribal size of a of a Norman cohort, right? So that idea also inflating the numbers organically to to avoid saying there were multiple or too many cohorts, right? Not to give the impression of this dramatic um, pa uh, manpower display was was relevant um, but it had to do also with the nature of these units and the way they were also filled and that there was a competition for being part of that right some of the officers uh, etc were, were well you know well educated people as well they came from a good kind of already privileged background so it was kind of a career uh, that you could undertake in the in the in the urban guard uh, in any case for today i stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye